Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. I'm your host, Chris Smith. I work here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in downtown Raleigh. It's good to be with you all again for another edition of our Lunchtime Discovery Lecture Program. Every Wednesday at noon, we bring you exciting people doing interesting work across all fields of science and technology, engineering, mathematics, education, art. We cover everything with this program. Uh, and it's an exciting collaboration that we have here at the museum with the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality. We're a great team putting on a great show. Uh, this program has actually been going on for quite some time now. So I'd encourage everybody after this one, hang out here on the museum's YouTube channel and check out the Lunchtime Discovery Series playlist on our channel. There you can find an entire library of really great and interesting topics and people that you can learn from. Uh, it's a really cool resource. So bookmark it, check it out. Uh, of course, you can also like subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel and then you'll get notified when we go live with the next Lunchtime Discovery Series too. So uh, it's good to be with everybody. Thanks for being here with me. I'll remind everybody that as we go throughout today's presentation, feel free to jump into the chat on YouTube or the comments on Facebook. Leave your thoughts, questions, insights, experiences as we go throughout the program. After today's presentation, I'll actually be looking to all of you, the viewers, for questions during our audience Q&A session. So I need questions in the chat to be able to ask our guests. So help me out. Drop your thoughts there in the chat box. Uh, and today's guest, if you've been watching the Lunchtime Discovery series or been around this program for any length of time just about, or been hanging out around the museum a little bit, then you are likely to be familiar with Matt Bertone. Matt is the director of the Plant Disease and Insect Clinic at North Carolina State University. He is an incredible entomologist and a pretty darn good wildlife photographer too. And he's today's guest on the show. Matt, welcome. Uh, thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. Um, so I guess I can start sharing. Is that, uh, is that the deal? Uh, yeah, I think we can jump right into it. Sure, it. yeah. Okay. So, um, let's see. Hold on, let me get to the right slide. <laughs> well, while you're doing that, I'm going to let you know that uh, there's already someone in the chat who says Mutilidae and Stictaceae are my favorite families of wasps. Okay. So uh, well, we've cool. got some guest experts hanging out in the chat today, I think. Yeah. So hopefully everyone can see that. Hopefully you can see this. Um, and uh, Thank you for inviting me. Um, I will start out by saying I am not an expert in bees and these wasps. Uh, I know a bit about them, but um, I've done a bit of research for this talk, and uh, I'm glad to have done so because there's some really interesting things uh, about these things, these bees, wasps and bees that dig the ground, basically. Okay, so uh, without further ado, I will get going, and uh, basically, um, just a little bit about ants, wasps, and bees. So they are in the insect order Hymenoptera, which has about 150,000 species in the world. They do a lot of different things. They include many familiar insects that we know, most being parasites or predators of other arthropods. But as you'll see in this talk, there are vegetarians and whatnot around. Um, most have this haplodiploid reproduction where fertilized eggs become female and unfertilized eggs become males. And actually the mothers can choose whether they're gonna produce females or males uh, by fertilizing the eggs or not. Um, and it's a huge diversity. It's a really interesting group of insects uh, that are also go through complete metamorphosis. They have larvae and adult forms. Now the larvae are usually hidden in or on a host or in a nest. So this is for many of the species out there that uh, I won't be talking about today because they are either one hanging outside of uh, halfway inside this plant hopper nymph. Uh, this one is attached to a spider sucking out its blood. There's of course lots of wasps that nest uh, up in areas where the larvae live in the nests and ants of course are type of basically type of ground nesting wasp. Uh, but I'm not gonna talk about ants today uh, and their larvae are found in nests as well. 
And uh, many of the wasps that we know uh, do nest above the ground. So you have things like paper wasps that, or umbrella wasps, they call them, that make these paper nests on the, in the, under the eaves of homes, under leaves. This is one, a tropical one and on the leaf. Um, you've got bald-faced hornets and other aerial yellow jackets and hornets that make these huge paper nests up in trees. You've got a lot of uh, um, wasps that also make mud nests. So many people are familiar with the organ pipe mud daubers, which stuff their nests full of spiders. And then there's things like potter wasps. Here's one collecting mud to create these really beautiful little pots that they load with uh, caterpillars and to feed their young. So these are out and about, out in the open. Um, then there are a lot of cavity dwelling nest, uh, nesting, uh, cavity dwelling and nesting uh, bees and wasps as well. So here's a leaf cutter bee uh, investigating a bee hotel. These bee hotels kind of mimic the uh, plant pits, the stems in some plants that are out in the wild that have hollow pits that these uh, bees and wasps like to nest in oftentimes. They also use other cavities, uh, you know, drilled out holes from beetles and other, and even humans. They'll sometimes stuff and pack with their uh, provisions to, to raise their young, depending on whether it's a vegetarian or not. And or some of them make their own holes, much to our dismay. So things like carpenter bees drilling holes, drilling large holes in the wood. And when they drill these holes in the wood, they make these tunnels and they fill them with uh, pollen and nectar, seal them off with wood, wood chips and wood dust, uh, sawdust, and lay had laid an egg on the source, and you get these larvae that develop. So these are cavity dressers, uh, uh, cavity nesters, dwellers. They're the ones that are above the ground. But that's not what we're going to be talking about today. So today we're going to be talking about nesting in the ground. So why would you nest in the ground? Well, it's a safe place away from uh, prefaces by some predators. Um, it's thermoregulated and pre protected from the elements, most of the elements. Of course, there's flooding and things like that that can happen. Uh, often uh, these ground nesting bees and wasps use sandier soils rather than heavy clay soils. That's because it's much easier to dig in. Um, and I will say that um, if you are not seeing these in your yard or around, they do avoid dense turf or vegetation because it's much harder to dig in. So they often like open uh, patches of ground to nest in. And oftentimes that's where you'll find all these wasps and bees and they may all be nesting in a similar area because that area is conducive to ground nesting. And of course, soil and earth ground is found all over the earth, literally. So uh, of course, there's gonna be lots of things that nest in the ground. Um, so I'm just gonna get right into it. And basically what I'm gonna do is go through some of the groups that will, you'll commonly see nesting in the ground. There's, I will say that it's really difficult to generalize any of these groups. There's so much variability, even within a species. Sometimes it's even the environment that's more, um, that dictates how they nest. So if they nest in a certain type of soil versus another, the same species may develop different tunnels. Uh, even the same individual may create one nest one way and another nest another way. So really I should just warn everybody that these are very nice descriptions of some of these wasps and bees, uh, that there's so much diver diversity out there. Um, but all the ones I'm gonna be talking about today are that you can find in North Carolina. So, so get out there and take a look maybe after the talk. Okay, I want to get out of the way two groups of wasps and bees that um, are not really technically digging in the ground. Uh, so the first are yellow jackets, even though they come out of the ground. Uh, they're interesting in that uh, even though it looks like they live in a burrow, they actually live in a very large cavity where they make up paper nests, just like the hornets and, 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 and uh, yellow jackets that nest up in the trees or similar to paper wasps. So it's not just a burrow, they basically find a cavity, oftentimes it's a rodent burrow, it could be a, a rotted out stump, something like that where they can go in, the queen can go in, start a nest, and basically inside there is a very large paper nest. Uh, so they're basically, um, you know, uh, opportunistically nesting in the ground. They, they do prefer to nest in the ground, but again, they don't really dig a huge cavity on their own. It's usually something there. Um, and then another group are the bumblebees. So the bumblebees are social bees uh, that nest in often in old rodent burrows and places like that or cavities in the ground, often among uh, uh, hay and leaf litter and things like that. Um, but because they're opportunistic, they also nest up above the ground, often in bird boxes, 
um, and places like that. So again, they're not technically one of the wasps or bees that we're, we're gonna focus on today, even though you will find them coming out of the ground. Okay, so the first group, uh, spider wasps. So your nightmare's worst nightmare. So uh, basically these are the family Pompilidae. Uh, all hunt spiders of various types. And it's a really interesting group. They prefer female spiders and spiders that are heavier than the wasps themselves. So this is to give lots of good food for their young. Uh, some of the groups uh, make little mud nests under uh, objects and uh, to fit them in these little mud nests, like this picture shows, they actually paralyze the spider and then clip its legs off, which is really grotesque. But this is how they fit them in these little mud pots. Now that's not technically nesting on the ground, um, but these are kind of, this group is the less, is kind of less specific to ground nesting than some of the other groups of wasps and bees we're gonna talk about. Uh, some also just chase the spiders out of the burrows, sting them, they paralyze them temporarily, and then they let the spider run back in, it wakes up, it has no idea what happened, and it's now got an egg on it, and it runs back into the burrow, thinks it's safe, and of course it's gonna get eaten. So, and then some actually steal prey from other spider wasps. So they'll attack them and grab that prey uh, and use it. They, will, they will, won't do any work and just do that. But there are some ground nesting ones. So um, these are some figures from a paper and I'm gonna show a lot of figures from papers. There's some really nice drawings out there from a lot of different researchers uh, um, historically. And uh, they're really, really cool diagrams, I think. So uh, some of them actually cover the burrow with debris or pat down soil with the abdomen. So this one, that this nest was really interesting. The description they it um, it it uh, used this burrow and uh, put the spider in there. Uh, but before that, it actually put little uh, pieces of grass and and twigs and things like that underneath. And then after it put the spider in there, it filled it up with some soil, loose soil, and put some more uh, needle pine needles and grass and twigs and things like that over top, probably to protect it. Uh, some just use shallow cavities in the ground or among roots, so they kind of don't do a lot of work. Um, but a lot of them in, will actually use the host or other animal burrows. So some of these are uh, attacking uh, ground nesting spiders. Uh, the uh, some of the uh, some of the wolf spiders uh, prefer to nest and create tunnels in the ground, and so they will actually use the same burrow that the spider used. Um, so that's pretty horrific, but. Um, yeah, that's how they do it. That's how they eat. But uh, spider wasps are very, uh, they're very hard to observe too because they're very nervous and erratic. Uh, so people can often find them collecting the spiders. They can know what host they have, but actually following back to the nest can be really difficult. Uh, so there's not a huge amount of descriptions of the nests out there, but this is one group of wasps that, that will nest in the ground. Okay, so some hunting wasps. So these, like the spider wasps, uh, hunt prey uh, that can include things like uh, insects and spiders. So these are mainly in these families, Specidae and Crebronidae. Uh, Crebronidae is probably gonna be split up into a bunch of other families. They're a really diverse group of wasps. Small to very large wasps. Some of the very tiny ones are only a few millimeters long up to ones that are a couple inches long. Um, and they have immobilized the prey with parallel venom. This can be either temporary or permanent. And this sometimes actually alter the post behavior. So cockroach wasps, for instance, are really famous uh, for stinging them in the cockroaches in the brain and causing it to be zombified. And it, it can then be led to the nest without putting up much of a fight. And then the, the wasp doesn't actually have to do much work because the cockroach is walking on its own. Now, one, one I just showing here, a black and yellow mud dauber, they don't nest in the ground, but it's a representative of this group. Uh, many of you are familiar with their mud nests up on uh, up on the sides of houses or in human structures. But the ones I'm going to be talking about today are, again, all nesting in the ground. So the first and one that's very pertinent right now this time of year is the cicada killer wasp. So this is a very large wasp, one of our largest wasps, definitely, I would say, probably the most massive wasp we have in North Carolina, uh, growing up to two inches or so in, in length. Um, I say this time of year because they are uh, active when the annual cicada hosts are active. Um, they will take the periodical cicadas if, they're, if they emerge coincidentally, but really they're only active when the, the guaranteed year-to-year -year cicadas come out. And those are gonna be around late June at the earliest uh, through the early fall, basically. Now, when they emerge, the males will stake out territories. It's usually a bare open patch of ground. 
and they'll hover around and kind of chase off other males and they'll wait for females to come through that will mate then with them. Um, so some people get freaked out when the males are acting aggressive. Of course, the males don't have a sting and the females are basically harmless. Um, they are only interested in hunting cicadas. And they have a very weak sting if you were even able to get them to sting you. So just want to throw this out there. A lot of people are worried about murder hornets and things like that. They keep, they'll you know, send me photos of these. Uh, these are not even closely related to hornets. They are a hunting wasp, but again, a very large and robust one. Now they'll nest communally up to three and a half feet underground, uh, and some will use the same entrance, uh, and up to four females may provision the same nest simultaneously, um, and only one of them makes the initial excavation. Uh, so you'll have a patch of ground that may have many of these wasps in there, and they're, it's kind of like an apartment complex. They're not really, they're not helping each other necessarily, but they're kind of neighbors. They're nice neighbors to each other. Um, and of course, as their name implies, they hunt cicadas. That's why they're so big, because cicadas are large insects. But it uh, gives nice meals for their young. And so they'll grab these cicadas, they'll sting the cicada, grab it, uh, fly it down or crawl it down to where the nest site is, bring it into the burrow, uh, lay, egg, lay an egg on them. Uh, it provisions more cicadas for when they want to uh, develop a female uh, than a male. The males require fewer cicadas uh, to eat. Um, and then what happens is this time of year, the larvae, you know, once the cicadas are in there, the larvae will hatch, they'll start feeding. They will feed and kind of go into kind of, um, uh, kind of a state of hibernation over the winter and then resume feeding in the spring, again, to emerge in the summer. Uh, these were actually dug out of a, of a sand pile uh, on campus. And you can see how large the cocoons of these uh, wasps are. Of course, they, and then coming out of the burrow, these ones emerge over a year after I got them. So it took a while, uh, but they're large too. So, and they'll come out again every year, basically looking for cicadas. So that's a, that's a one major one that you'll see now. Uh, one of my favorites is the steel blue cricket hunter. So uh, this is a really interesting genus of, uh, of wasps. Uh, in, in fact, there's some different behaviors. So this species doesn't do this, but some species actually They'll grab crickets near their burrow, sometimes chasing them out of their burrow. And once they wrestle them and sting them, they'll lay an egg and let the host uh, wake up from this paralysis and again, go back to the burrow, some, somewhat like the spider, some of the spider wasps. Now this species though, actually digs a burrow first and often uses other wasp burrows. Um, and it provides each cell with several crickets, uh, closing the cells temporarily while they hunt. And when they go out and hunt, they, they paralyze the cricket and they hold it like this, grabbing the antennae in their jaws and bringing them back to nest. And uh, this was a really cool diagram I saw. So they do often actually use cicada killer burrows as well. So they'll let the cicada killers dig this larger burrow first, and then they'll go in. And apparently the cicada killers don't care. And it's all good fun to have more people or more wasps involved, but they'll, um, they'll dig a burrow off to the side, a smaller burrow, uh, and they'll place the cells in there uh, with, the, with the cricket hosts. And many of these wasps and bees, will, when they create, they create one near the end, that's the first one, that's gonna be the oldest one, then another one, then another one, then another one. Um, and usually the older ones, even though they may emerge first, they have to wait uh, for these other ones to develop before they can come out. Okay, another large wasp, hunting wasp around here is the great golden digger wasp. They nest in open areas with bare soil, uh, again, a common theme, uh, often in aggregations, up to hundreds of females sometimes. Uh, that can be worrisome if you had, if you're nearby, but again, these hunting wasps are not social. They don't, they don't uh, need to protect a nest uh, or, a, or a communal nest, and they're all doing the work themselves, so they don't wanna risk dying. So they're not usually aggressive. They, you can get near them, uh, they're not going to come out and sting you just for no reason. Uh, they dig a main tunnel, when, uh, then side cells, about one to seven, uh, which are provisioned with several katydids and relatives. They mostly prefer these cone-headed katydids, very large katydids that we have around here. A uh, single cell egg is laid per cell, so there's multiple of these katydids and only one egg. And then when done, they pack the tunnel with loose soil and may make up to 11 nests. Uh, and they may nest together or use other burrows. And there's a really interesting paper showing the burrows of the great golden digger wasp. So again, 
they fill it in, backfill it in afterward with loose soil, but they make these side chambers, these cells that have uh, numerous cadids in them with one egg. Um, and when they grab the cadid, they sting it. Uh, they then uh, drag it, uh, similar to the steel blue cricket hunter, back to the nest. And I'm not going to go through all of this, but you can see what is involved in uh, studying the behavior of these different wasps is that they do a lot of different things uh, depending on density of other wasps nearby, abundance of prey, things like that. You know, there's a lot of getting prey, you know, digging a tunnel, going to get prey, dropping them, checking the tunnel, doing all these things. Um, and, you know, they, they, uh, researchers often produce these um, diagrams to show all these different activities that they do. Um, very interesting stuff. Okay. Uh, Thread-waisted sand wasps. Uh, this is a really uh, distinct group of wasps, of uh, hunting wasps. They have these really long, thin uh, abdomens. Uh, they hunt caterpillars and put in a simple nest they dig before finding the prey. And an interesting thing is they may mass provision or successively provision it. So mass provisioning means more than one prey item per egg. Um, but successively means they can come in even when the, the egg is hatched and the larva is developing, they'll come in and put more uh, prey in there for the larvae to eat. And this actually happens with, with several types of wasps uh, that, that will, may do it. Uh, they may revisit the nest to check on them and they actually have a really good memory to find them. Um, there's, a lot of, there's been a lot of behavioral studies with this group of wasps uh, because uh, they, they use different features of the environment, and it's just a big question about how they're able to find these nests so easily, especially when it's mostly just sand uh, all over the area. They also have been uh, linked to tool use, although there's, you know, it's probably uh, evolved from just very stereotypical wasp behaviors, but they'll grab rocks in their jaws, and when they want to close up the nest, they'll kind of vibrate their body and hammer the, the um, the rock against the nest entrance to kind of uh, conceal it uh, with, uh, with um, debris. Now there's a related genus, Podolonia. Uh, they actually find one large caterpillar and then dig the nest afterward. Again, they're not gonna be provisioning with more than one caterpillar. So they go and hunt the caterpillar first, bring it somewhere, dig a nest, and then uh, put it in. Okay. Another hunting wasp is an interesting group. I'm trying to highlight some of the more interesting ones. So are the bee wolves. Uh, these are the genus Philanthus. And Philanthus literally means bee lover. Uh, and they don't love them in a good way. They love them in a bad way for the bee because they hunt bees, mostly swept bees, which I'll be talking about in a few minutes. They make moderate burrows about you know, 35 centimeters deep, which is about a little over, it's over 10 inches uh, deep but with multiple cells. And an interesting thing is they may use these for more than one generation. So um, if they'll have multiple generations per year, you know, the early ones, they'll, they'll use the same nest, but just keep adding to it. And you'll see that in the next slide. Uh, they'll will nest together, but also individually. And young adults may actually stay in the nest for a bit. Uh, so they're kind of somewhat social, but um, not you social. They're not truly social like bees and ants, uh, like honeybees and ants. Um, and one of the really interesting things about this group, uh, perhaps one of the most interesting things in all of wasps is that they have these special pockets in their antennae that house beneficial bacteria. And so when they create these cells for their young, um, and again, they're providing them with bees, what they do is before they close off the cell, they actually exude this, these uh, bacteria that help to kill uh, um, other bacteria and things that will, and pathogens that will kill the larvae. So really strange uh, holding, you know, it's like having a, a, a bottle of Neosporin in your face kind of, it's really weird. Now here's one with a, with a sweat bee underneath it. You know, these, these bees, these are small wasps and the bees are small too. And here's just an a he, above head view uh, showing the, the um, sand that's kicked out. And then these black ones are the old nests from previous generation. And as they basically new generations start digging further and further into the ground. Now there's lots of other ones I could go probably speak for a whole semester on all the different hunting wasps out there. It's a huge variety. Um, there's some really interesting ones, Lara, uh, species. They actually hunt mole crickets and similar to some of the uh, cricket hunters, they will 
uh, go into the burrow. The cricket freaks out, leaves the burrow. The wasp comes back out into the open, wrestles with it, stings it, lays an egg, and allows it to recover to return to the burrow. And there are actually some have been imported, I think, to uh, help control some of the mole cricket pests that are in the southeast. The horse guard, Stichtia carolina, is one of the few with a common name, and they are cool because they collect horse flies uh, for their young. So anybody who's been bitten by a horse fly know that these are out there collecting them and, and eating them. Uh, and they will actually hover around horses and cattle and other livestock. And the livestock uh, often may know that this is not a horse fly, that it's actually a wasp. And they won't freak out when these wasps come by because they're actually hovering around looking for the horse flies, which are a nuisance, obviously. Uh, Cerceris uh, is the largest, is the most diverse genus of hunting wasp in, the, in North America. Uh, and the adult, they collect adult beetles. Many of them collect weevils, but one, Cerceris fumipennis here, collect um, jewel beetles. And they've actually been used to monitor for emerald ash borer, an invasive pest and a major pest of ash trees. So what they'll do is people will sit near their nests and when the wasps come back with the beetles, they can see if there are any emerald ash borers there. And the wasps are much better at looking around the site and the area for these beetles than humans are. So really interesting behavior uh, from the humans uh, using uh, these wasps. A status species collect nymphal stink bugs. Uh, and bemics are really interesting. They nest in loose sand. sand. Uh, they collect flies and progressively provision as the young grow. So they keep adding flies when the larvae are growing. Uh, and they can dig very quickly. Many of these wasps have these little rakes on the front legs that can that help them to uh, very quickly dig tunnels in the sand and burrow. So these are some different hunting wasps that are around. Uh, very common around uh, the areas, especially sandy areas uh, and areas where they're conducive. Now, there are lots of hunting wasps also that nest in cavities and create mud nests above the ground as well. Okay, so now on to bees, the vegetarian wasps. So these actually, most people don't know this, but bees actually evolved from hunting wasps. They don't look like it really, uh, you know, to a uh, systematist, a morphologist, they might, but basically they, uh, they evolved from all those hunting wasps I just mentioned. Actually, they evolved from, the, from uh, the recent studies, a specific group of hunting wasps that, um, that uh, feed on uh, flower infesting uh, insects called thrips. And they think that maybe they started grabbing pollen and it was nutritious. And so they became very specialized to doing that. But anyway, there's a lot of bees out there. There are about 20,000 species of bees out there. And the majority of them, several of them, several families are solitary ground nesting species. So about 75% of those 20,000 species are solitary ground nesting species. Uh, there's some social species that also ground nest. Um, and they provision their cells with pollen and nectar for the larvae to eat. Uh, so they are not a hunting wasp. They are a, like I said, a vegetarian wasp. And, and flowers, of course, have developed most often to be pollen, pollinated by bees. Uh, so it's a beneficial mutualism. So the majority also line their cells with waterproof materials. So this is to keep uh, from flooding and also from, they suspect because the, um, the pollen and nectar can rot more easily that uh, it may keep the cells uh, conducive and regulated for keeping that pollen and nectar fresh for the young when they, when they uh, hatch. Now, uh, there have been a lot of studies on ground nesting bees. Uh, this was an interesting figure from one of the papers, um, basically what types of soils they prefer. And basically uh, at 100% clay and, and basically majority clay, you're not gonna get any of these. So our area here, you have to have a good mix of certain other uh, materials in with the clay, sandy clay uh, or whatnot. But basically as your percentage of sand gets higher, you get more of these uh, bees. And of course, this is probably very true for the hunting wasps as well that like to nest in the soil, in the ground. Um, now bees, this is from a, a recent review, a, a very recent review this year uh, on uh, nesting habits, habits of ground nesting bees. 
So they, they do all different things. Again, it's really hard to generalize these things, but uh, you can have things that are just a one cell plus a plug. Uh, and a lot of these um, wasps and bees will uh, nest near sticks and rocks and things like that as a kind of help, uh, helpful shelter or maybe to shade out some of the areas. Uh, there's also um, turrets, which are these chimney-like structures that extend above the ground. This may be so that uh, soil doesn't blow in or, or, or things like that, but there's not, not a real good knowledge on why the turrets are built. Um, and the brood cells are piled into chamber-like structures. Uh, then you can have these really funky nests. I could not find uh, an explanation today by today for why they make these loops around the cells. Uh, but this is mainly vertical gallery with lateral tunnels and brood cells directly connect, connected to the main tunnels with loops surrounding a few cells. Um, or, you know, it'll be a nest entering forming a tumulus. That was an interesting new word for me. A tumulus is really just a mound of dirt, uh, of soil that's pushed up around the entrance. Uh, and that could be descriptive for the types of bees, um, how big that tumulus is and things like that. And it leads to these kind of branches off the main uh, tunnel. Okay, so a couple of the groups of bees that are out there, they're gonna nest in the ground and are solitary typically. Um, the cellophane bees, the family Colletidae. Uh, these are solitary, but will nest in large aggregations. Uh, hundreds of females will nest in, in one bare patch of ground. Uh, now they're called cellophane bees because they line their, uh, they first line their cells with smooth earthen layer. Then they tamp the surface smooth with their abdomen and then apply a secretive flu, uh, film of cellophane like material. And what this, I'll show you in a second what that looks like, but it is actually a true polyester. So it's an ester that's uh, polymerized and it's based on uh, macrocyclic, macrocyclic lactones that are excreted from a gland in the abdomen that's then mixed with saliva that causes it to, when it's put onto the walls of the cell, turn into this basically almost indestructible type of material. They've actually used, researchers have used a lot of different, um, a lot of different um, types of solvents to try and dissolve them and they dissolve, they don't dissolve very easily. Um, they fill the cell partway up with pollen and lay a single egg on the ceiling. Uh, and they'll create several cells in a row. And they've actually described this in the literature that uh, it's unlike some of the other uh, digging bees that will often just put one cell on this, each side or, or at the end of a tunnel, main tunnel. Uh, these will create a number of cells in the same line. And they say that because this is a more primitive group of bees and, it, um, and many of the uh, colletids actually nest in twigs and do make uh, sequential cells down, the, uh, down the, the length of the twig, that this may be just a holdover from that. And so here is uh, some of that cellophane. You can see it is, just looks a lot like cellophane. So again, these, these multiple cells that, are, that have caps, that have these cellophane lids on them. Um, and this one actually shows the egg in the top of the cell and this kind of pot of, uh, of pollen and nectar. And so this Dufour's gland, which is linked to the, the stinger, uh, also linking with the stingers, the poison gland, produces these precursor chemicals. And then they have this special tongue that you, is used to kind of pat the surface of the inside, inside surface of the cell with this chemical that will then harden and become this really interesting plastic-like uh, material. So they're basically producing kind of plastics almost and really, really interesting uh, bees. And like I said, other bees will use other compounds to um, waxy compounds, things like that to uh, line the burrows, but this is a fairly unique thing uh, for, for the bees. Okay, mining bees are very similar. Um, I don't have much specific to say. Uh, they are solitary bees that nest alone or communally. Um, here is one, you, you can actually see the face of, a, I think, a male sitting in this nest. Here's a female of this species uh, digging in the ground right here. Uh, and this is a species of Andrina. Um, again, these are similar, very similar to uh, Coletids, the cellophane bees. Um, and, but, you know, don't, this is what a general kind of uh, communal bee 
area will look like. So again, the vegetation is very dense. You got all these holes with these mounds. And you've got lots of bee activity. And the really interesting, the really cool thing about these bees, or I guess the thing I should tell people is that you see all these bees uh, coming out, swarming around the ground, things like that. These also, these solitary bees are very, very docile. Uh, in fact, I laid among this group of bees to take photos uh, for an hour or so. And they basically just kind of waited patiently for me to leave because I was, I was kind of annoying them. And they would just pop their head out a little bit or they'd fly around me and go into their holes. But honestly, they, they're not aggressive. They are not, um, uh, they're more of just may, may, maybe a nuisance, but they're great pollinators. They're really interesting insects. And typically all of these, a lot of these uh, solitary ground nesting bees are only active for a few weeks at a time during certain parts of the year, typically the spring or the fall. Uh, this was in the spring, and we often get most of our calls about ground nesting bees and play, playgrounds and places like that in the spring. Um, and we just tell people, if you can handle it, just wait, they'll be gone. They'll be basically completely buried. The females uh, that made all these nests will, be, will die, and basically their larvae live through the winter and will develop into new adults next year, uh, the year after in the spring. Now, uh, Andrina, um, the burrows are fairly simple. It's just a main uh, uh, tunnel. And then this is an overhead view showing kind of the cells, just random cells off the main tunnel. Okay, swept bees. Uh, some of you are familiar with these bees because they do like uh, people. Uh, and they're, it's a huge family. They're, they're very diverse, over 500 species in North America alone. Um, and they do like people because they are, and the name sweat bees because they like to land on people and drink your sweat. So if you've ever seen a tiny, tiny bee on you, they're usually dark, sometimes metallic. These are metallic -y bronze. Um, that's a sweat bee. Uh, basically, the majority of sweat bees uh, nest in the ground. Um, and they range from solitary to eusocial, even in a single genus or species. Um, I've even read that environmental factors will influence whether they kind of nest on their own or if they form groups and become social. Um, and some of the eusocial species are like honeybees where there's a queen, they're workers, things like that. But again, nesting in the ground. Um, I will say that other halictids, other swept bees, a lot of them do also nest under the bark of fallen trees uh, like logs where they'll make little mud nests under kind of um, under things. And you can tell those apart from the spider wasps in that when you pull them apart, you, they'll have pollen in them rather than spiders. Um, the nest can be simple with lateral cells or have a large chamber with brood cells in the middle. So um, for instance, this is a really pretty um, Agapostemon uh, sweat bee. They're this metallic green with the striped yellow and black abdomen, really pretty bees. And this is a typical nest for, a, for one of those where they have a large main tunnel and then these very long uh, tunnels leading to a single cell that has the pollen ball and the egg laid on top of it. But there's a lot of diversity among uh, these sweat bees. So some of them just create, again, these simple tunnels, uh, but others, many of them will, like, a, like I mentioned, will create a tunnel to a large cavity. And then within that cavity, they'll create a bunch of these cells uh, so it's basically like a large room rather than everybody getting their own room kind of thing. And the last group of bees are the digger bees uh, in the family Apidae. Now Apidae um, contains uh, the bumblebees and honeybees, which are kind of the more familiar social bees. Uh, but uh, some of the genera here, the Anthophora, Habropoda, and Milosodes uh, can be found here. Habropoda actually, um, this one right here, you can see it's on a blueberry plant. They're specific to blueberries. So they're really important pollinators of blueberries. Um, and uh, they, these often, they're, they're a bit larger than the other solitary bees uh, that we're, we've talked about already. Uh, the helictids and sweat bees are much of the smallest. Andrenids and the coletids are kind of medium sized. These bees can get a little bit bigger, even the size of a small bumblebee. Um, and they often create burrows with turrets or chimney. Um, so here's what Melisodes, they have all these kind of complicated tunnel system, um, but here's an Anthophora that has created a turret. So they basically uh, bring uh, the soil up and kind of pat it around and use saliva to make this kind of chimney outside of there. 
Um, here's a really uh, cool uh, picture from Katja Schultz on this uh, Phyllothrix uh, bombiformis. I wasn't able to get the video to play here, but I'm gonna real quick stop sharing and see if I can share the video. So here's, um, here's a video of that happening. I hope you can see that. But they know how to work their abdomen really well. They can they kind of bring up the the wet soil and um, and pat it down with that abdomen, creating that turret. So pretty cool. Um, of course, uh, busy as a bee, they say uh, they are very busy, and uh, could probably watch this for hours. But uh, very very cool behavior uh, that these bees have. All right, back to the other thing. Okay, so um, so that's basically about the bees and wasps that nest in the ground. Um, and uh, like I said, there's so much variation, even within one species, and depending on the soil, things like that. Again, it's really difficult to specify uh, exactly what each thing is gonna do all the time. Uh, but this gives you a general idea of what lives in the ground, uh, these bees and wasps that live in the ground. Um, and uh, I'm going to mention a couple of things, but really just give a plug for something. But uh, one thing I want to mention are satellite flies. They're really interesting. I'll probably talk about these again. Uh, I'm only going to mention some of these enemies of uh, the ground nesting wasps and bees because I'm actually going to be speaking at Bugfest this year, which whose theme is the theme is uh, bees. I'm going to be speaking of predators and pra parasites of bees. So I'll be including some of these things, and I won't spoil that yet. But one of my favorites are these satellite flies. They're a group of flesh flies. Now, flesh flies typically feed on decaying uh, dead animal material, um, many of the species in that family. But this subfamily, Miltogramini, uh, they are called satellite flies because they patrol uh, around solitary wasp nests, uh, including bees, from a distance. And what happens is when that wasp goes, they'll quickly go in and lay maggots in the brood cells. The, the maggots will then eat the eggs of the bees and the wasps and then eat the food stores. So they are what are known as a kleptoparasite. They steal the food stores of these bees, these hardworking bees and wasps. Um, really interesting group of flies. But again, I'm just going to plug my talk for Bugfest. Uh, I forget which day it's on, but keep an eye out on the schedule because I'll tell you all about things like this. Uh, so enemies of ground nesting bees like this and this and this. I don't know if anybody would even know what this thing is, um, but tune into my talk uh, in a few weeks and, uh, and um, you can hear all about this thing. So um, are there any questions? That's the, that's the last part. There are indeed some questions, but first, wherever you're at folks, let's give Matt Bertone a big round of applause. <laughs> and say thank you matt they're all clapping for you for great, all, for all over the world everybody's clapping everybody's or they can drop clapping emojis into the chat <laughs> box that works too uh fascinating stuff i mean the the diversity is really incredible and the diversity of strategies that uh, i mean i know they're all different species and different groups and and families but still that they have so many different ways uh, of nesting and foraging and hunting is really impressive. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. I, I mean, like some people just focus on one species and you can find so much behavior in just one species. And to pull together this talk, it was, it was tough because there's just so much, you know, the same, in the same genus, one species in North Carolina would do something completely different as one in Brazil, say. And it's just like, so really tough to summarize, like I said, and, and there's always exceptions, basically. So I, I was thinking, you know, one of the species you called your nightmare's worst nightmare, <laughs> and, and wasps in general have like this really bad reputation uh, for being mean. Like I see memes on the internet all the time, of, you know, like bees are great and cuddly <laughs> and fluffy and wasps are their like, you know, evil cousins. And everybody just seems to really dislike them. But do they really deserve that reputation? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I 
you know, so I wouldn't say basically like I said, bees are just wasps. So are ants basically, and they're stinging ants. The bees obviously can sting too. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I think it's this thing. I think mostly the people really dislike social wasps like hornets. I think that's that's the main because they they especially at this time of year. I've heard a few things because of the whole murder hornet thing, but a lot of people are getting you know, people get stung by uh, European hornets or other hornets because they have huge colonies to defend and they have uh, lots of brothers basically lots of sisters to defend and so one death here there to defend the colony to is really so that they're they're more apt to come sting you say but that's a minority of the species of bees and wasps that are out there and like i said these social bees and wasps are just want to be left alone. They want to. They they don't have time for us. They want to. They you know you see how busy they are. They they make these really elaborate burrows. They need to then go hunt prey or collect pollen. And so they are not interested in you. Uh, if you leave them alone, even if you sit among them while they're doing this stuff, they're going to do what this bee is doing right here. They just kind of sit there and watch you and wait for you to go and probably cursing you out. But that's the worst you're going to what's going to happen. So they definitely do not deserve the, the, they have much more interesting lifestyles and much more beneficial um, action to us. Even hornets and yellow jackets that can be aggressive are really good at uh, pest control because they like to eat things like caterpillars and other insects that can be pests of our gardens. And so, you know, often I say, if you can stand having a nest somewhere in your yard or if it's way back somewhere and you just see them patrolling a little bit, they're busy. They're not worried. It's like they're trying to get their lunch. They're not worried about you. Now, if you come near the nests and those specific wasps, then they have something to protect. But again, majority of these species are not aggressive because they don't need to be and they don't want to be. That's excellent stuff. Yeah, I've had several unfortunate run-ins with some social wasps this summer uh, yeah. where I, didn't, I did not know the nest was there. That's the problem with the yellow jackets That's, in the ground. You know, if you're mowing the lawn, I've done that a couple of times mowing the lawn, the vibrations really make them agitated. And they're, they have no problem flying <laughs> out and seeing people. So I will say, you know, the yellow jackets, they can be really uh, annoying to really dangerous. Um, but, you know, again, it's just hornets being hornets and yellow jackets being yellow jackets. So, but these ones won't do that. So that's cool. Yeah, these, the, I'm going to like these and I'll just dislike the others. I shouldn't do that either. Okay, uh, questions from the audience. And folks, we drop more questions for Matt in the chat, uh, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. I've got those both pulled up here. So uh, let's see, the first thing that came in is from Mike Dunn, who is curious about uh, wing flicking behavior or some kind of wing wiggling. Yeah. And wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So um, I've observed it a lot. I read a little bit. I saw some mentions of it in some of the papers. I don't exactly know what it's for. Um, I'll have to go back and read because it, it is an interesting behavior, especially so spider wasps. Typically, they're really like that. They're very uh, nervous. They twitch a lot. They, they flick their wings a lot. They, they twitch their antennae a lot. Um, it, may be, um, it may be just another form of kind of warning things that they're that they're a wasp that they're you know something that's out hunting um i don't but i don't exactly know i have to i'm gonna have to go back and look at, at why they flick them now a lot of the other wasps don't there are many wasps that won't flick their wings um and bees really i don't i don't think they i don't really observe them flicking their wings that much uh like i said spider wasps i they're very common also some other parasitic wasps that you find around that are not in these groups uh, will flick their wings. And so it may just be kind of a, a signal to like, don't mess with me because uh, I will sting you if you mess with me kind of thing. So, but I'll, I'll, I'll find that out. I'm, I don't know how to get back to the person, but it's, uh, but yeah. <laughs> uh, if you find out, you can let me know. Sure. Uh, and, and I think I can get that answer to Mike. I know Mike. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, Is the polyester, the natural polyester, being studied as a plastic alternative? So I, I, I don't know specifically. I am sure people have looked at it. Um, uh, I don't know how feasible some of these are in kind of production, but it is. I, I, don't, I think chemically it's very similar to what you would wear, like polyester that you'd wear. So it's um, really interesting that they can make that. Of course, 
all these things are hydrocarbons. A lot of this stuff, you know, plastics and things that we have are based from organic material anyway. So oil and things like that is organic. So it's not strange for creatures to make this if you think about it. Um, but no, I don't know of any, I don't know personally of, of, of studies. Again, this is not my expertise, but, uh, but yeah, I would imagine that there's probably some studies looking at the chemical, there are definitely studies looking at the chemical composition of it. I don't know if people are trying to mimic it or uh, scale it up or anything. All right. Let's see here. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm doing the scrolls. Once the female has buried the egg and the food, the larvae is unprotected by her, yes or no? Uh, basically, many of them, they do. They just kind of, yeah, they're, they're making, you know, they've done all their parental care by making like a nice little cell for it, giving it all the food it'll need for it to develop, you know, and actually depending on how much food is provided, the, the wasp usually will survive, but it may be a smaller wasp that emerges at if it has less prey, um, things like that, but, um, they're not going to sit there and defend. Uh, in fact, they're off trying to make as many nests as possible, often, uh, trying to make, lay as many eggs and collect it, you know, because the prey is hard to find sometimes So the, they spend a lot of their energy collecting prey. So, um, defending it is more for kind of this, where they become social, the social issues where, or social situations where, um, you have, things that are not uh, other members of the group that are not breeding. So they have time to do def defense and to collect more food and things like that. So, um, but the solitary wasps are just really, they're kind of, they're doing it all on their own basically. Okay. Uh, Kate goes on to say that one of their bluebird boxes was taken over by bees and they want to reclaim it. and want to know when that's safe to do. Yeah. So um, it depends on what kind. So, um, the, you know, it could be bumblebees often do that, but you'll get paper wasps and other kind of wasps that nest in those cavities. Um, if it's bumblebees, I would say once you, if you wait till the winter, uh, that's a good time. So many of the social wasps and many of these wasps as well, you know, they really only have one generation per year. They basically, most of the winter, you just have uh, in some of these solitary wasp nests, they're going to be just the larvae developing in the ground. In the um, in the social ones, like the bumblebees and uh, hornets and things like that, what happens is they mate in the fall, and then those queen the queens mate, and all the workers and all the males just die off. And what happens? The queens then go when the, after mating and hibernate over the winter. So then the nest is basically abandoned. Everything else has died off. Um, and so there's really nothing left in there and that's when it can be cleaned out usually. Um, that's the same with if you have a hornet's nest, you know, at this time of year that, that you're worried about, um, you may just wait a few months for it to kind of uh, get cold. Once it gets cold, the, all the members will die except for those mated queens will go spread off and then spread out and you, that nest is then empty and, and inactive. So. There you go. There you go, Kate. Okay, uh, let's see. Kim Sue is asking which types of bees are cultivated by humans in hives. So we know there's European honeybees. Mm -hmm. uh, are there others? Yeah, so um, they do um, cultivate some stingless bees that are related to honeybees, kind of not, not closely related, but they're, they're kind of a tropical uh, bees that are stingless. They, they will cultivate them in the tropics in uh, large tubes or, ca or cavities. Um, and they do, they do make some honey, I think, but uh, they're not like honeybee honey productive. They, uh, they're they're um, a little less productive at least. Uh, mostly it's the honeybee um, uh, for as, as far as uh, cultivating it for say honey or for things like that. Um, now, like things like bumblebees will have little pots of honey and things like that, but it's not really anything we can harvest or use in any large quantities or anything like that. So it's really just a, a few different species of honeybees around the world uh, in the genus Apis, which is the, the honeybee genus. Now there's some very large ones, uh, some smaller ones. We have Apis mellifera, but there's others, uh, Asian honeybees and things like that. There are different species. Okay. All right. Although that brings up another question for me. Uh, if somebody wanted to encourage 
a wasp diversity, like, you know, if they do native plant gardening and that sort of thing, and they're like, yes, let's get all of the critters going. Um, how could people encourage that? Like, are these being wasp hotels a good idea? Leave bare ground in your yeah. yard? Yeah, I was thinking about that too. I was thinking about raking up some of my lawn to get some of these wasps to nest there because I, I just love those aggregations of the wasps coming in and out looking all busy and everything and so you know you gotta look at all the, the things that they need so uh adult bees and wasps can't take solid food they can only drink liquids and so almost all the time that's going to be uh flowers flower uh nectar from flowers so even the hunting wasps go to visit flowers a lot so having a good diversity of flowers is really important uh, some of these wasps also go to tree wounds and sap flows and things like that to feed on the sugary substance. Uh, then you, having a lot of diverse habitat for their hosts. So again, you know, some of them hunt caterpillars, some of them hunt uh, katydids. Of course, the bees are, you're going to need the flowers for the pollen and the nectar. Um, and then, yeah, so some of the ground, you know, if you have a very nice turf lawn, then you're not going to have as many spots for them to nest. Um, but the bee hotels for above ground can be really good. Um, but you got to make sure that you maintain them. So one important thing is you can't just leave them out year after year. What happens is parasites build up, build up really well in them and it'll kind of actually work against the populations where they start to find those, they try and nest in there and they have more mites or more diseases or things like that in them. So that's often why people will put those little paper straws or things like that in so they can remove them, clean them out easily every year and then re-put them out there. Um, but even just collecting new uh, bamboo, things like that will help. And th that does help. Now, you also get a lot of parasites, which I'm gonna talk about uh, in a few weeks. There are a lot of really cool wasps that parasitize other things, even bees and other things. There's all different, you know, if there's something doing work, there's something that's gonna take advantage of that. But yeah, having lots of wildflowers, lots of diversity of plants in the yard and in areas can be really important. I think that's the number one and, and redu reduction of habitat destruction and things like that. Excellent advice. Okay, uh, a few minutes left here. Let's see what we can get through. Uh, you've got a fan. What kinds of mutilids can I find in North Carolina and the best areas to find them? Oh yeah, well, I, I, I guess I'm not spoiling it too much, but uh, that one photo I showed, that reddish ant looking thing at the end that, that uh, um, that is a mutilid, a velvet ant, and they're really interesting. We have, we have numerous species here. The most obvious is the cow killer, which is a very large um, mutilid, the largest one we have. And they, they like bumblebee nests. They actually uh, parasitize and kill bumblebees. Uh, so they'll go in their nests. But that other one I showed was actually in that same area where all those little swift bees were nesting. And it was sniffing around with its antennae, the nests. And so again, these wasps are, are, have a very potent sting. They are tough. They're very, very tough critters because they are attacking. They're going into the nests of bees and other wasps oftentimes. And they can be, obviously, those bees and wasps do not want them in there because they are going to steal all the food and for their own young uh, by laying eggs in there. So um, That'll be something I'll talk about more uh, in September when I talk about the enemies of bees um, because they are, they can be a major one. They're cool wasps, cool little wingless wasps. Excellent. All right, folks, you've got it. You'll have to come back for Bugfest, September 13th through 18th. Bugfest.org for information. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Caden, age seven, wants to know why bee and wasp stings hurt. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, there's, there's the chemical composition, like what, what's in them. And uh, basically what it does is a chemical that sets off all your nerves uh, and all the pain nerves. And so that's obviously important. So the, um, you know, it's, it's because they use it for both defense uh, and for paralyzing prey. So, um, so actually they have uh, different cocktails that, that are the pain things, in, especially in, in animals that they want to protect themselves against. And they're the different chemicals in the mixture that are there to paralyze the prey. So um, basically stinging wasps, uh, they develop their sting probably mainly for taking down the prey first. And then it's very useful. It's just like a lot of other animals like, uh, you know, venomous snakes or things like that. They use that venom for prey, you know, taking care of prey first, but it's a really handy defense mechanism. 
Um, I don't know what the exact chemicals are in there um, that, that make them painful, but they definitely target the, the pain receptors in our, in our bodies. There you go. All right, let's see, Elodie Murphy, also age seven, wants to know, many years ago, did horses think that fly-eating wasps were actually horse flies trying to bite them? Yeah, I don't know how that evolved. I, I imagine over evolution, over evolutionary time, that, um, that these animals uh, could, well, actually you gotta think back to when horses and cattle and stuff like that were here in, in North America, but uh, obviously there are deer and things like that that were prey for the uh, horse flies that were, that were, fed, that were the blood feeding horse flies fed on. But um, many of the animals can tell the difference between a horse fly sound and a uh, wasp sound by the buzzing and all that stuff. And so they probably very easily know, OK, this sound, I get hurt. I'm going to bleed and get a pain. And this sound, they're just around me. And uh, so, yeah, so that's uh, it's probably that way. But they're cool wasps and they will hover around and look, grab the horse fly right off the animal even. That's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. So helpful. I know. All right. Well, let's see. I'm looking at the clock and it looks like we've hit our time. Matt, it is always a pleasure to have you on the program. Well, thanks. Yeah, it was great being here. And uh, yeah, it, like I said, I'm not an expert. There are a lot of people here that know more about bees and stuff. And if you ever, ever, ever have any questions, I can field them and get the, the best answer possible to you. So. Thanks so much. Now, uh, if folks want to keep up with the work that you do, is there a way for them to do that? Um, uh, I do, I'm on Twitter a bit, so I post some cra crazy critters that I find a lot. I take photos, of course, so I like to post them when I have them. Um, and just kind of general, mostly science stuff, mostly uh, critters, mostly insects and spiders and whatnot. So, yeah. All right. Uh, how do they, I, they can just search Matt Bertone on Twitter. Yeah, it's, uh, it's at Bertone Amaya, which is Bertone, uh, B-E-R-T-O-N-E -E with an M-Y-I-A at the end, which is just uh, the Greek word for fly. So because I flies are one of my specialty groups, not bees and wasps, although uh, those cool <laughs> satellite flies are really interesting. So, yeah. Great stuff. Well, thanks, Matt, thanks so much. Yeah, of course. Uh, everybody, thanks for tuning in to today's episode. That was a really cool talk. Uh, cool. Matt stuff is always the best. Uh, <laughs> so thanks, everybody. Everybody's dropping their appreciation for you in the chat too, Matt, just so you know. Great. Great. Well, thanks uh, for everyone for joining. And we will see everybody next Wednesday at noon. Don't forget, everybody. Uh, let's see. So we've got Bug Fest coming up September 13th through the 18th. Monday through Thursday of that week, we have special virtual programs just like this one that we'll be bringing you. Hit up bugfest.org and look at the virtual programs tab in order to sign up and get information for any or all of the programs that look interesting to you. And then make sure you check out too, uh, Saturday the 18th, there's a couple of special programs happening at Prairie Ridge Eco Station. Some cool stuff uh, around pollinators and moths happening throughout the day on Saturday. Don't miss it. It's going to be great fun. Bugfest 2021 Plan B. Um, and I'll go ahead and let everybody know the Wednesday after Labor Day, I want to say it's the 7th, we won't have a lunchtime discovery program. So uh, you've got the day off, everybody, the Wednesday right after Labor Day, but we'll be back the following Saturday with a special Bugfest edition of the lunchtime discovery series. But until then, I'll see you all next week. Take care, stay safe, and keep your community safe. Bye, everybody.